Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's filtered webinar, Data Analysis in Excel 2016. Uh, in the driving seat today is former ICAW IT faculty chairman and filtered course author, Simon Hurst. Simon will be taking you through the key tools and functions to use when conducting data analysis in Excel 2016. By the end of the webinar, you'll be able to handle data sets from very small to the very large and present your findings using the most appropriate charts. Before we pass the controls over to Simon, just a quick word about Filtered uh, for anyone unfamiliar with the company. We're an online training provider specialising in the use of adaptive technologies to personalise content, accelerating learning and reducing training time. We won't teach you everything, just what you need to learn. Check out filtered.com to see our range of courses which can train your staff in key business and software skills. For all of you social media savvy individuals, you can follow us on Twitter with hashtag filtered webinar to get updates, report back, or send us questions. Simon will be answering your questions um, about the webinar at the end of the session, so please submit them into the chat pane during and we'll collect them as we go. I'd now like to hand over to Simon to start the webinar, so uh, over to you, Simon. Thank you very much, and uh, thank all of you for being there. Uh, there's quite a lot to get through this afternoon, so I'm probably going to have to go fairly quickly. And also, there's loads of scope for all sorts of things to go wrong, because we'll be using quite a few uh, of the more advanced features. Um, so we'll uh, we'll make a start. First of all, it's worth mentioning that by data analysis, we'll be looking mainly at pivot tables and the business intelligence tools in Excel 2016. There is another set of um, sort of statistical functions and statistical uh, features included in something called the analysis tool pack add-in. Uh, we're not really going to go into that aspect of data analysis very much. We'll be looking at uh, pivot tables and things that depend on pivot tables. And I'm going to start off sort of pretty basically just by showing you what a pivot table is, what it can do, and then fairly quickly we're going to go through some more advanced pivot table stuff, look at Power Pivot, look at the, the various other uh, Power BI things that uh, Microsoft have given us in the last few years um, before we, we finish with uh, hopefully time to have a look at the new standalone Power BI uh, desktop application that Microsoft released uh, towards the end of last year. So to start with, pivot tables. Uh, just a, a, a bit of background, I, I always find it quite hard to explain pivot tables, so I usually don't. I usually just do one and hope that, uh, that in doing one it's pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, but just, just worth saying a few bits and pieces about what pivot tables do in general. First of all, they can cope with a, a whole range of data volumes. I think some people think that pivot tables are just about enormous data sets, big data, um, you know, stuff that you find on the, the web with millions of rows. Uh, and yes, pivot tables can can handle that sort of stuff, particularly if you, you're using the, the Power Pivot add-in or, or the Power BI application. But pivot tables are, are equally useful if you've just got a few dozen rows that you want to, to summarize, um, understand, and present. So whatever set of data you're working with, uh, certainly worth investigating pivot tables. Very important uh, with pivot tables is the structure of the underlying data. So if your data is not properly structured to start with, you're probably going to find that pivot tables uh, aren't really going to do what you want them to do. So we're just going to have a look at the data we're going to start working with. Uh, here's a, a sort of set of invoice data. Uh, this actually comes from uh, Microsoft have a database product called Microsoft Access and that comes with several uh, sample databases that you can use to acquaint yourself with how it works. This is quite an old one, this is one called Northwind um, and this is the invoices uh, query from Northwind and this shows you the sort of data that works best when you're working with pivot tables. Uh, all the data is arranged into columns and rows, pretty, pretty obviously really, uh, and each column can only contain data relevant to, to that column. And unlike Excel itself, the way databases 
tend to work is that they force all the data in a column to be of a particular type. So if you say a column is going to hold dates, then everything in that column must be a date. So you can see here that our data is correctly structured. We've got our fields. Uh, we've got all sorts of different types of fields, text fields, date fields, value fields. And let's just pick a few that we'll be using as we go through this afternoon. So we have a field for the country that the sale was made in, the salesperson that made the sale, the, the order ID, the order date, and then we've got the product that was sold. Uh, we've got the quantity that was sold, the price per item, the quantity times price to give us the extended uh, price um, and the, the product name. So all the sorts of information we might want to know about uh, how well we're doing with our sales. So structured data to start with and then if we look at this just as a big block of data it's quite hard to understand anything about it. Uh, it can't really see just by looking at it what our best product is, that sort of stuff. And that, that's where pivot tables come in. So pivot tables help us to summarize and present the data. And I think, again, another sort of common misconception is that pivot tables are difficult and complex. Uh, they're actually very, very simple. Yeah, certainly, they, they have complicated bits if you want to use them, but you can also use them in a, in a very, very simple way. And they're probably by far the simplest way to summarize data in Excel. Excel has loads of complicated functions you can use to, to summarize data, some ifs, some ifs, all of those sorts of things. Uh, but the, the quickest and easiest way to do it is often just to, to use a, a pivot table. One of the things that it is worth mentioning about pivot tables, uh, and a big difference from, from using formulae, is that when you use formulae in Excel, the result, unless you've turned your calculations to manual, uh, the result changes instantly to, to match any changes in the data. That's not necessarily the case with a pivot table. If you create a pivot table based on a table of data in Excel, then in order for your pivot table to reflect any changes in that table of data, you would need to refresh the pivot table. So it's just a slightly different way of thinking. Instead of thinking instant update, you just have to think, I need to, to refresh the pivot table. You can also link a pivot table directly to external data. So in this case, we, we brought our data into Excel, but we could have accessed it directly in the external database. And when you do that, you have the ability to set the refresh up to be automatic, uh, but not as the data changes, but as a period of time. So you can say refresh my data every five minutes, something like that. And then finally, uh, what, what I'm about to try and do as our first foray into pivot tables is to create a product top 10 league table in approximately a dozen clicks of the mouse without using a single formula. So here's our data. Uh, it's actually an Excel table. We can tell it's a table because when we click any cell in it, we can see the table tools design ribbon tab, and we can see that it has a, a name. Because it's a table, if we go to insert and pivot table, automatically the pivot table will use the name of the table. Uh, it's one of the big advantages of using tables is the basis for a pivot table. If you then add information to the bottom of the table, that will automatically be included in the table. And when you refresh your pivot table, it will include the new rows. If you just refer to a range of cells, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Sometimes you have to change the pivot table data source to reflect any additional rows. We can then choose to put it in an existing worksheet or a new worksheet. We'll say new worksheet, click on OK and we get the skeleton of our pivot table. And over here on the right hand side, we have our field list. And you should remember that these are the column headings. So the column headings from our table become our list of fields. And we can then choose whereabouts in the pivot table to put them. Now we want to examine our products, see what our best products are. So if we just scroll through our list, we can see that we've got a product name field here. And all we need to do, just tick it, so select the product name, and you'll see that that automatically goes into the rows area. That's because the product name is a text field. It knows it can't add up text, so it treats it as a label and by default puts it in the rows area. If we go to the extended price, the value of each sale, and just single 
click on that, you'll see that automatically goes to the values area because it is a number and Excel can therefore add it up so it assumes you want to treat it as a value. Uh, if you find that your values are not being treated as values, so if you tick your value and it doesn't go to the values area but it becomes a label, the most likely reason for that is that your column, your field, includes something that Excel doesn't recognize as a value. It could be a blank rather than a zero. So um, for this to, to work as easily as it can, then uh, all of your data, as I said at the beginning, must be properly structured. So everything in a, in a uh, field for numbers must be, a, must be a number. So here we've got our list of products. Uh, we can see the value, the total value by product. So, so we're getting closer to understanding which are our best products, uh, but still not that close because, for example, if we look at the number format, it's not a particularly easy number format to, to spot the highest items because those without decimal places don't show up in the same columns as those with. So first thing to do is probably to change the number format. So let's right click on any one of our numbers, choose number format, and we'll go to custom and choose a number format that has no decimal places and shows negatives in red with a minus. And just by doing that, because all our digits now line up, we can now much more easily pick out the, the really high value products. But we can go further than that. So let's now just uh, decide to restrict what we're going to see to the top 10. So we'll filter our products and we could do this on the basis of all the ones that begin with A or something like that, but we want to do a top 10. So we choose top 10 and we want to filter by value. So we want to filter by some of the extended price. It's called top 10, but it can be top or bottom and it can be more than 10 or less than 10 and it can be based on items percent or sum. We'll leave it as top 10 items. And when we click OK, then we can now see our top 10 selling products. Still not that straightforward because they're not in a suitable order, they're, they're alphabetical order rather than a league table order, so we can right click, choose sort, more sort options, and choose to sort in descending order, not alphabetically, uh, but by value. So don't know if anybody was counting the clicks. Um, there were about 12, I think. Uh, we've now got, as promised, our top 10 league table of products. So that's a, a very simple pivot table, and it just shows the power of pivot tables, and hopefully shows that they're, they're not daunting and difficult. If, if all you want to do is understand your data and summarize it, they're, they're very quick and probably the simplest way to, to do it. Uh, as I said earlier, if we change the data and needed to refresh, we would have to right click in our pivot table and choose refresh to update the data. Let's go on quickly and have a look at some more uh, pivot table features, some slightly more advanced pivot table features. We're going to look at grouping, at data values, the different ways we can show our data, and also at using the get pivot data function to extract particular elements of data from a pivot table. Uh, so we'll just go back to our pivot table here. Uh, just before we do that, worth just quickly looking at these other two areas. So if I were to add country, for example, to the columns area, we can see then we get a, a grid showing sales by product by country. Um, and I could add something like salesperson maybe to the filters area. That then becomes a filter where I can say, okay, just show me the results for a particular salesperson. So they're the, the four different areas. Let's just go back to showing all of our salespeople and we'll move uh, country out so we can just drag it away to, to move it out of the, the column. Uh, let's also drag product name out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the order date field and I'm going to drag the order date field to the rows area. And when I do so, you'll see that Excel, and this is a 2016 thing, if you're using 2013 or before, this will be very different. Excel 2016 automatically groups dates by years. You can see how old this data is. If we go back just briefly and look at our original data and look at the order date column, 
you'll see that the order date is a series of days. It's not grouped by month, year, or anything. It's just a series of days. When we add it, Excel, Excel 2016, now automatically groups it by year. And if we click the plus sign, we can see it's grouped by year, by quarter, and by month. So instead of just a long list of days, we've automatically got a grouping by year, quarter, and month. And the order date field itself has been grouped into months, but two extra fields have been created, years and quarters. And these behave just like any other fields, the fields that were originally in our data. So for example, if I were to drag years to the columns area, uh, then you'd see that it's just another field and our data is shown uh, with the years as the columns. Let's just get rid of uh, years. And if we didn't want our data grouped in this way, or if you're using an earlier version of Excel and it doesn't group it for you automatically, what you can do is right click on any one of your dates, choose group, and that will show you the existing groups. So you can add or remove groups, or you can just right click and choose ungroup, and then it will restore the data just to showing the days. So if you're using 2013, for example, that's how it would have looked when you added order date to the row area. To group it in the same way that 2016 groups it, you could right click, choose group, and then choose more than one grouping thing. There's a better word than thing, but I'll go, go with thing for the moment. More than one grouping thing at a time, um, and then click on OK, and you'll see the way that it's then grouped into those time periods. So that's grouping. Let's get rid of all of those and let's just add salesperson as a row. So we've just got a very simple table here. Now what I'm going to do next is probably going to look a bit strange to start with, but I'm going to add extended price several additional times to the values area. So now I've got the same column over and over again. This is sorry, this is going to be a bit tedious, but just to make things easier to see, I'm just going to set the um, the same number format for each one, so uh, uh, it won't take too long. If anybody knows a brilliant way of doing this all in one go, uh, please let me know. So now we've got five different columns all with the same value. We started off with sum, and we can change that to show us different things about our data. For example, we might also want to know not just the value of what Andrews Fuller has sold, but how many sales he's made. So we could right click on our value, and we could choose summarize values by, and instead of sum, we could choose count, and that would tell us the number of order lines relevant to Andrew Fuller. Uh, we might want to know the average sale value for Andrew Fuller, so we could choose summarize values by average, that would give us the average, and we want, might want to know perhaps his highest or his lowest sale, we'll go for the highest, click on max, and there we can see the highest sales that Andrew Fuller has made. So that's just changing the way the data is aggregated. The other thing you might want to do, just for presentation purposes, is, is rather than these rather ugly headings, you could just change these to something like uh, total count, just by clicking and over typing average max. And what we're going to do here, let's let's um, do a couple of things here. So if we again right click this time, rather than summarize values by, we'll choose show values as, and we can show our values in several different ways. So for example, we could show them as the percentage of the column total. So if we choose that option, uh, you'll see that that then shows each of the totals as a percentage of the overall total. We could also choose to show the values as difference from, so perhaps here we have a, a sort of a benchmark salesperson, say Laura Callahan is our benchmark salesperson and we want to know how our other salespeople have done in comparison with Laura Callahan. we can click OK, 
and we can see here that that then shows sales as the difference from Laura Callahan's sales. And finally, we can choose a running total. So if we go to show values as a running total in salesperson, then you can see that we get a running total. Probably make more sense if you did it by date, but you can see the, the way that it works. I'm just going to go back to the difference for a reason we shall see in a minute. Um, now, I think the other thing I was going to do here was to look at get pivot data. So this is to do with uh, if you want to extract some data from a pivot table. So pivot tables are, are fantastic in terms of, of summarizing the data, showing you the data, but they're not very flexible. You can't, for example, insert a line in the middle of a pivot table. Uh, so you're pretty much stuck with the, the table approach. If you want to use some of the data from your pivot table elsewhere in your, in your worksheet, you can do so. For example, you can just click on equals and then maybe click in the uh, Robert King total column and you'll see that, that you might think that's going to give you B11. It doesn't give you B11. It uses get pivot data and what it does is to say that you're going to get the total from the total column in the pivot table that starts in cell A3 where the salesperson is Robert King. So if we just accept that, you'll see that gives us our value which matches our value in our pivot table. But the problem with this is that it's, it's hard coded. If, if we copy it, it just stays the same whatever, whatever we do to it. If we want to look at a different salesperson, we'd have to uh, go in and, and retype the name of the salesperson. So let's just make this a bit easier. Let's just make column L a little wider. Type in Robert King. Go back to our get pivot data function and replace the typed in Robert King with a reference to a cell. So a reference to L7 that contains the name Robert King. And that will then mean that if we type something different in, Nancy of Olio. Because our get pivot data function contains a reference to L7, that looks up Nancy Davolio and that will then give us the value for Nancy. It also means if we were to need to look at several salespeople, Andrew Fuller, um, Janet Leverling, we would be able to just copy that down in order to extend our get pivot data function. So that I think that's everything from pivot tables two. Let's move on to the the third section of, of pivot tables, uh, where we're going to look at um, pivot charts and how to move charts and slices. Uh, just before we do. There's just one other thing I wanted to show you here, and that's the ability to apply a conditional format to a pivot table. Uh, this uh, arrived with 2007, in fact. If we apply a conditional format to one cell in a pivot table, let's use data bars. This will look pretty strange because if you apply a data bar just to a single cell, it will just fill the cell, but you'll see a, a formatting options button appears and if we click that we have the ability to extend that conditional format to our pivot table area. So it doesn't apply the pivot table just to a particular range of cells, it applies it to an area of your pivot table. Now if you do all cells showing some of extended price values and you've got a total, then that will include the total. If you do it all cells showing some of the extended price values for salesperson, then if there was a total, which in this column there isn't, uh, that would exclude the total, which is usually what you'd need to do. So we'll choose that and you'll see that that then applies the conditional format to the whole area of the pivot table. And you can go a bit further if you if you like doing conditional formatting. Uh, we'll go to manage rules, we'll edit our rule, and we'll uh, make the red brighter, and we'll make the negative value black, um, and also we'll turn off the numbers. 
Uh, so you just get a, a graphical representation of the difference as one of the columns in your pivot table. Let's again just simplify our pivot table a bit just so we can start on looking at charts. Uh, let's have, um, what should we have? Let's have the year field. So we'll just set up a simple pivot table here. Let's just delete our get pivot data. And if we wanted to turn this into a chart from the pivot table tools analyze ribbon, we can choose pivot chart. That will give us a choice of charts. Worth noting, one of the things we're going to cover briefly later on is the six new chart types provided with 2016, tree map, sunburst, histogram, Pareto, box and whisker, waterfall. They're not available with pivot tables. So if you try a tree map, you'll see it can't be used with a uh, data from a pivot table. We'll stick with a simple uh, column chart, a simple clustered column, and that will create our chart for us. The chart and the pivot table are linked, so if we change one, the other will change as well. I'm just going to create a second pivot table based on my same data set. So I'm going to do insert pivot table. Uh, I'm going to stick that on another new sheet, and we'll just do this one slightly differently. We'll use extended price, um, but maybe this time we'll show sales by country. And let's just do that as a, again as straightforward bar chart. So let's do it, in fact, as I say, as a bar chart. So we've got two charts on two separate sheets. Now, one of the things that we're, we're seeking to do is to turn our data into something that's, that's valuable, turn our data into information. And one of the, uh, the things that uh, is now quite popular is a dashboard. Uh, so a, a very um, condensed view of your data where all sorts of information is shown on a single screen. So we're certainly not there yet because we've got our two charts, but they're on separate screens. So let's create a new sheet. Let's call it dashboard. And let's go back to our charts and let's move both our charts onto our dashboard sheet. So here's our first chart. We'll go to the design ribbon tab, move charts, and we can choose to show it as an object in our dashboard sheet. Click on OK. There it is in our dashboard sheet. And we'll do exactly the same with our other chart. We'll show it as an object in the dashboard sheet. And now we've got both of our two charts in our dashboard sheet. Let's just move them around, neaten them up, and let's make column one a bit deeper. Column one, row one even, and column A a bit wider. Uh, let's just uh, fit the chart so it's not overlapping column A. So here we've got our, our two charts. And you can see how quickly you could build up a dashboard where you're showing all sorts of different information about your data uh, all on the, the same sheet. So somebody's just got one sheet to look at to make all sorts of comparisons and, and correlations. Now, when we looked at pivot tables to start with, we looked at filters, um, and they were sort of fairly boring little drop downs. Uh, there is an alternative, and that's to use a thing called a slicer. So if we go to insert slicer, you'll see this will give us the fields from our data set. And let's choose um, products. Uh, let's choose country and products. So we can choose several slicers, set up several slicers at the same time. And you'll see these are the, the slicers. Let me just fit them on the screen, make them a bit wider. And slices have their own ribbon tab. And you can do things like increase the number of columns. So you can see all of your products. Not quite enough room there, but we'll see a few more. Uh, country, we ought to be able to see all our countries if we go for four columns. And these operate as 
filters. So if I just want to see the sales for Argentina, I just click on Argentina and you'll see that changes my chart just to show Argentina. If I just want to see a particular product, I can click on the product and that now shows me just sales for that product for that country. I can drag, select a group of countries, um, I can click and control click to select individual items. Now, what we want to do is to move from controlling one chart to controlling our whole dashboard interactively with these slices. And that's the real benefit of slices. Okay, they do have some sort of visual appeal uh, above the, the simple filter field. But the thing that really um, makes slices important is that you can right click on a slicer choose report connections and you can link your slicer to multiple pivot tables and therefore because the charts are based on the pivot tables multiple charts on your dashboard so here I've linked my country slicer to my pivot table one as well as pivot table two I'll do the same thing with my product slicer so now both of my slices are linked to both of my charts which means if I let's just clear the slices, if I change a slicer then my whole dashboard, admittedly it's a dashboard that currently only contains two charts, but my whole dashboard then changes to show me the results. 2013 also introduced a specific type of slicer called a timeline and timelines work with times and dates, so it only shows you time and date fields and these are just a, a specific, let me just make column A just that bit deeper, these are a specific sort of slicer that just gives you a more sort of intuitive timeline approach so you can just drag a few months and that will then uh, change the results just to show you the results for those months so timeline is just a specialist type of slicer. Um, right, let's move on from Dashboards to Power Pivot, and Power Pivot is uh, an add-in that's not available to all editions of Excel. Uh, it's quite a complicated story. Power Pivot was freely available for Excel 2010. It's then restricted, and I think both Excel 2013 and 2016 and generally you either need the professional plus version of Excel or at the very opposite end of the scale you need the standalone uh, Excel that you can buy uh, from uh, Amazon other online retailers are available uh, for about 80 quid but Power Pivot uh, once you've installed it, it, it as I say it's an optional add-in once you've installed it uh, it adds a ribbon tab to your uh, ribbon area and it's like pivot tables, but, but it does more. It copes with much larger data sets. Microsoft claim hundreds of millions of rows. I haven't personally tested it with hundreds of millions of rows, but I have tested it with a few million, and it did work. Uh, you can use multiple different data sources. So there's no really easy way with a normal pivot table to bring in data from different sources. You can bring in data from different tables in the same source, but not from different sources. With Power Pivot, you can bring in data from different sources uh, and combine them, link them, and also you can combine that external data with data in an Excel workbook. So it's very flexible if you want to uh, add to your data ad hoc, you can create a table in Excel and use that as part of your data source. Also, where the, the pivot table data is hidden in this sort of shadowy thing called the pivot table cache, which you can't really see, with Power Pivot, your data is shown in table tabs where you can see the, the data and you can uh, manipulate the data. We'll see that there's a, a whole language that goes with Power Pivot called DAX Data Analysis Expressions that enable you to add um, fields to your data, uh, create all sorts of, of expressions, uh, including lots of, of date expressions. So if you're doing financial stuff, often when you're doing financial stuff, you're comparing one period to another period, there's lots of DAX expressions that help you analyze your data by period. And the other thing you can do with Power Pivot data, and also some general pivot table data, is to use 
what are called cube functions, which sort of like get pivot data, uh, but they enable you to get at your underlying directly using an Excel function. So let's have a quick look at uh, Power Pivot in action. So we click on the Manage button, and that opens the Power Pivot window. Don't panic, it's on its way. Power Pivot is quite um, resource hungry. Uh, so you may find, uh, certainly the more memory you have, the better. And you may also find that if you have issues with Power Pivot, uh, if you exit Excel and then go back in, uh, that will enable Power Pivot to, to work. So, <laughs> so hopefully it's on its way. If not, oh yes, we can see down here that it's loading the, uh, the data model. And here is the... Power Pivot window. We'd already set it up in this this workbook. Um, so uh, the the data itself will appear soon. But you can see here that we've got the Get External Data option, and you can see all sorts of different data sources that you can use. Uh, we're going to just use a, a simple Access database. In fact, the same database that the data uh, that we looked at. Uh, earlier and imported into Excel uh, came from. So let's just go and find our data. I'm going to use Northwind and we'll see here that this gives us access to all the underlying tables of data in our database. You can see the data here. This is, you need to know a bit about databases to understand this. Uh, we'll uh, look at all the details, so we'll try and reconstruct the same sort of information we were looking at earlier. And we can get Excel to do some of the work for us, so we can tell Excel to find out which tables are related to all the details, and it tells us that orders and products are related to all the details, because each order detail line needs to know the order that it belongs to and the product that it contains. And we can again click select related tables, and this will show us the tables that are related to the tables that are related to order details. And this is where we get our customers, our employees for our salesperson, um, and various other bits of information from. We can preview and filter a particular table to see the data that it contains, maybe to filter it so we don't drag all the data across the network if we only want a particular month or something like that. Then when we finished, it will go through and it will import all our data for us. You'll see here it's working through our data. So firstly, we looked at exercise... And it, the data preparation bit is it looking at the database to understand how these different tables of data are linked. So it's now building the links between the data. We can click on details and see that. When we click close, the data appears in our Power Pivot window. Um, and we can see the different tables. So this is what I was saying about being able to see the different tables of, of data. We can also uh, go to a diagram view of our data where it shows our data as tables and how those tables of data are linked to each other. And it just takes a few minutes to reorganize the view. There we can see our table and our links. And I, I mentioned earlier the, the DAX functions and the fact that a lot of them rely on dates. Um, one of the things you have to do if you're really doing some of the date stuff in Power Pivot is to create a table that has all the possible dates in your data set. Uh, various DAX functions only work if, if there's all the dates. And 2016 introduced this new feature where you can create a, a new date table and it will automatically create a table for you that has all of the, the dates from or, or that could be in your database, so there are no gaps in your dates. You'll see here, this is the new table that it's created. In order to use it, we need to link it to, say, our order date here. So we would link our date 
to our order date in order to create the link between the uh, oops, sorry, a bit premature there. Uh, let me now do it. Uh, that then creates the link between the two tables, so we could now use some of these more complicated uh, data analytics expressions. We'll just switch back quickly to data view just to see our data again and to see our date table. You'll see the first date is in 1952 and the last date is uh, in 2012. The reason for the gap is some of the employees were hired in 1952 so to ensure that all of the dates are included it's found the first date in the entire database that we've brought in and the last date and added all the dates in between. Hence we've got 21,000 odd rows. And then once you've sorted out your data, let's just very quickly uh, look at a, a DAX expression. So here, as I said, you can access your data directly. So we could create an extended price field. Oh, let's do the, sorry, that should have been the heading. Let's do the formula first. We'll do quantity times price and then we'll double click in the column heading and just let it finish and we'll call that extended price and then just like with normal pivot tables we could very quickly turn that into a sort of a dashboard style presentation we could go to pivot table we can create all sorts of different layouts so for example we could create four charts in one go uh, this will then create a, a new worksheet with four charts and we can just go to our data we can add our extended price that you just saw me create and then we could add something like the uh, salesperson last name and then we could go to our customers the country that the customers in and then Oh, just while well, I'm here, uh, a new feature in 2016, the ability to search. So if you just type X in the search box, then you can quickly go to extended price and you can see how quickly we could create our dashboard, then add our slices and so on. Um, visualizations, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll see some of these later. Excel now has some additional chart types, the first for many years. So you've got hierarchy charts, a tree map and the sunburst hierarchy chart. You've got some statistical charts, histogram and box and whisker charts. And you've also got a new waterfall chart, often used when you want to show movement from one balance to another balance. As I say, we will look at one of those um, shortly. Let's just have a look at some of the new data visualization options. Now, there is one called Power View, uh, and this is a sort of been downgraded in 2016. It was there in 2010 as an optional add-in, and it sort of disappeared in 2016. Um, and we'll see that the reason for that is that many of the options now included in the standalone Power BI uh, program which we'll see in a second uh, but what we will do is we'll have a look at power map uh, which is now 3d map so when it was added it was called power map it's now a built-in uh, 3d map and what 3d map does is to enable you to plot your data if your data has some sort of geographical field then 3d map will allow you to plot that data on a globe uh, and you can then animate the data and turn it into a playable um, video. So if any of you uh, were here when we covered the 2016 changes, you might already have seen some of this. Uh, but here we've got our data. Let's add our country field as the location. Let's add extended price. You see it's matched 100% of our countries. We'll add extended price as the height of our data. We'll add the salesperson as the category. And let's just close that down so I can see what's going on. So here you can see our 
data points plotted on our charts. We can just change some of the options to make it a bit easier. Let's just make our columns a bit higher and a lot thicker so we can see our columns. And then we can add a time field. So if we add the date field as a time field and then we can choose to, to group it. So let's group by day. We can then play our charts and it will run through and play our values over time on the face of our globe. We've got several different types of visualization we can use. We can have more than one visualization at a time. We can have different scenes. Um, so we can have different visualizations. We can have different scene options like flying over our globe. Um, these all build up into a tour, so you can play a tour of your data and then you can turn that tour into a video. So if your data does have a geographical component, uh, then there's quite a lot in 3D map that might be of use to you. Now, to finish off with, I want to show you two significant um, new bits and one is Power Query. Now, Power Query used to be a separate, um, what I will do, I'm just going to uh, just close down Excel because it's getting a little bit slow. So if we just close down Excel and then I'll open it up again. So um, sneak preview there of Power BI. So let's open up Excel. We're going to use Power Query, which is now the, um, get and transform group. So the Power Query tool is now in the get and transform group of the data ribbon. And I'm going to open one I did earlier just to show you what's possible with, with Power Query. So Power Query is sort of the other end of the data from the, the visualization things that sort of takes the, the data and then displays it. Power Query is how you get at the data in the first place. So um, the Get and Transform tools give you all sorts of methods for getting at your data from all sorts of sources such as Facebook, the web, and then you can manipulate your data, clean your data, bring your data together. So in this particular example, what I've done just uh, as I say by way of an example, is I've asked Power Query to bring in data from a folder. So it's looking at a folder on my computer and it's bringing in all the files in that folder. So going back to the beginning, uh, you, you build these, you don't have to write all these steps, you build them up using these options. So here it's found all the files in the folder. Uh, we then gradually expand that to show us the sheets in the folder. We then only show certain uh, sheets and then we expand the sheets to show the individual rows and then filter some of the rows out. So we, we as I say, we're just sort of leaping into this data and extracting the data from every file in a folder. So the, the whole idea of this is automation. So having done this, we can then create a, a pivot table based on the data. We can maybe then use another view of the data. So we've used another query here to just extract the, just a couple of columns uh, of the data. So just the location, the sales value. And we've used that to create one of these new visualizations, a histogram. And then we've done a similar thing to use two of the other visualizations, the hierarchy ones, the uh, tree map and the sunburst. And then let's just see if this works. So now uh, there were four files. I'm going to open another file which has got results for Taunton in the county of Somerset. Uh, I'm going to save that into the folder that I'd created, the PQ folder. So it's got Devon, Suffolk, Sussex and Yorkshire. Sorry if you're not in the UK. These are UK counties and UK towns. So I've now saved that. And if we close that and go back to our data, uh, hopefully it's been set up to refresh automatically. I 
said at the beginning that pivot tables can refresh automatically every so many minutes. Uh, hopefully this has been set up to refresh every minute. So in about 17 seconds time, you should see down the bottom that it should say updating. And then here are running the background query. You should dramatically um, see Somerset appear automatically uh, as part of, of the two charts. So data, all we've done is put a file in a folder, Power Query has interrogated that folder, pulled particular rows out of one of the sheets in one of the files in that folder and added them to give us an updated view of our, our data. Now all this has been building up into uh, a new application that Microsoft launched towards the end of last year called Power BI. Um, and what Power BI, BI does, Power Business Intelligence, is to bring together all sorts of, of these add-ins, the, the, the data manipulation stuff in Power Query, uh, the manipulation and summarization features of pivot tables, visualizations, in order that we can go and get our data and then we can turn it into different visualizations of our data. So here I've used get data to link to the workbook we were just looking at and you can see here that I've got my different results so I could maybe choose a, a, a map, I could add country um, to my map as the location and sales and gradually build up different graphics uh, as a standalone application. The thing about Power BI is the basic version is free. The version that does quite a lot of this stuff is completely free. And you can do all sorts of clever things, like for example, if you go to Get Data, you can go to Microsoft's search engine, Bing, you can look for a particular search term. So if you're uh, into cricket, uh, I search for Ben Stokes, who is a cricketer. Uh, who scored lots of runs towards the end of last week and we can see Power Query presents a visualization of that showing how uh, interest in Ben Stokes um, increased when he scored all the runs, where the interest was focused, surprisingly large number of people in North America, um, and then reveals some news um, stories uh, about Ben Stokes. So loads of stuff you can do with Power BI. That's um, Sorry, I've, I've probably gone on far too long and not left any time for any questions, but um, I, I will now finish and just see if there are any questions that I can try and help anybody with. Um, any questions out there? Hi, Simon. Yes, we've, got, we've had a few questions here. I think we've got about four in total. Um, the first one, which was... Uh, actually, quite a bit earlier in the in the, um, in the webinar, is um, why would you not use the format painter to copy all of those extended price number formats? Um, because format painter, I'm pretty sure, copies to a range of cells and not to areas. The benefit of using right-click number format is it applies the number format to that area of the pivot table. So that area, if that area expands or contracts. Uh, the format lives with the area, not the particular range of cells. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, uh, and this was related to the the moment when you were doing power pivots with the access input there. Uh, this looks very much like access. Overall, is power pivot very different to using access? Yeah, it's a different thing. Access, if you're just using um, something that you want to interrogate existing data, then sort of the reporting in Access and the, the, the reporting in Power Pivot do have superficial similarities. The big difference is that Power Pivot is pretty much exclusively concerned with taking existing data and analyzing it, whereas with a, a, a proper database, then you're also coping with the, the input and management and storage of the data. So lots of similarities, but some significant differences as well. Okay. Um, next question is, can we get Sage accounting data from Power Pivot, or can it be obtained from a normal pivot table? By from, do you mean into? Uh, I believe there are um, dri what are called drivers that will allow uh, Excel to uh, use, I think it, it was ODBC, so in both a normal pivot table 
uh, and PowerPivot. One of the data sources is ODBC and um, that will, let's just have a look, New, let's do it this way, uh, database, um, somewhere there's ODBC, from ODBC. So if you install the correct drivers on your system uh, and go to the right place, you can then use um, built-in drivers to get at that data. So as long as the supplier has provided drivers that allow you know, any sort of open database to, to connect, then it should indeed be possible. Okay. Um, next question is, uh, does the 3D map only work with a globe uh, or can you choose different bases such as the UK? Um, you can flatten it, so you can choose a flat uh, map. Um, I won't go into it again because it takes a while to load up, uh, but if all you want is just a very simple map rather than spinning globes and stuff, have a look at inserts and add-ins and one of the available add-ins is Bing Maps and Bing Maps is a very simple little add-in that enables you to plot geographical data on just a flat map and that will zero in just on the UK if, if the data is only relevant to the UK. So probably easier than going through the palaver of 3D maps and then flattening it anyway. Okay, and um, this is going to be our last question um, for this session. Um, guys, anyone who, who has uh, fielded any questions that we haven't um, fielded live, we'll, we'll drop you an email after the session just because I'm a bit conscious of time here. So the last one is, can you add a, a comment column in a normal pivot table which can be integrated with the pivot table rows when you collapse and expand? Um, I think not easily. Uh, no, I can't think of an easy way to do that. If I do think of an easy way to do that between now and when I get home, uh, I'll uh, add it to the ones that we answer offline, but I can't think of a brilliant way of doing that at the moment. Good question. Well, they're all good questions. Okay, Simon, thank you uh, for that, and obviously thank you to everyone who attended. As I said, all the other questions we've received, we'll, we'll get back to you via email after the session. Um, thanks for attending Data Analysis in Excel 2016. Um, just before we leave, uh, if you'd like to re-watch the webinar, or if you missed anything, it will be available on our website um, within 24 to 48 hours. The best way to, to see that is to visit learn.filtered.com slash webinars. You'll receive a follow-up email uh, about an hour after the, um, the webinar's finished with all of these details on anyway. Um, and uh, if you've got any further questions um, about what Simon's um, covered in the webinar, do drop us an email at hello at filtered.com and we'll, um, we'll get back to you afterwards. Um, but that's everything from us. So um, on behalf of Filtered and Simon, thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed. And um, our next web webinar, PowerPoint, Keeping Your Audience Engaged, um, is on Monday the 1st of February. So do register for that. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.